Welcome to part three of this four part series on energy, equity, health, and solutions in relation to climate change. This series is a part of the American Humanist Association's Center for Education here for climate environmental response effort. This session will be recorded to air on hereforclimate.org and American Humanist Center for Education.org. I'm Kristen Wintermute, the Director of Education, and I'm pleased to be hosting this evening's event. I will now turn over to Caroline Peters, who's the intern for Here for Climate. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Caroline Peters, and I am the Here for Climate intern with the American Humanist Association. We've been working on this series for a few months now, so I'm very excited to be with you all here tonight for the sec or third part of our series. Just a few logistics to get us started. Later in the evening, there will be time for a Q&A. The Q&A function is available at the bottom of your Zoom screen in the control panel. I know for some that the chat is more familiar, so we will also be keeping an eye on the chat for those more comfortable with that function. If you would like subtitles, you can also access the subtitle function in that control panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now I will hand it over to Emily, who will introduce our speakers for the evening. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I'm Emily Newman, the AHA Education Coordinator, and I'm happy to introduce you all to our speakers tonight. We have Gloria E. Barrera, who works as a certified school nurse at a public high school outside of Chicago and as an adjunct professor of nursing at several universities. She serves on the board of directors of the National Association of Hispanic Nurses and is the first Latina president of Illinois Association of School Nurses and president elect of the National Association of Hispanic Nurses, Illinois chapter. She represents the American Public Health Association's public health um, nursing section in the Nursing Coalition on Climate Change and Health and is an active member of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. And also with us is Eugenia Gibbons, the Boston Director of Climate Policy at Healthcare Without Harm. For more than a decade, Eugenia has worked to build partnerships across interests and sectors to advocate for, develop, and implement state climate solutions that are sustainable, affordable, equitable, and achieve deep greenhouse gas emission reductions in New England. Eugenia previously served as policy director at Green Energy Consumers Alliance and program director with the Environmental League of Massachusetts. Um, I believe, Gloria, you're going to start us off. Yes, thank you so much for the warm welcome, Emily. Um, I'm really happy to be here with uh, with you, and thank you, of course, to the Humanist Association um, Climate Initiative for continuing these vital conversations. Um, I'm excited to join the conversation today on the connection of our nation's health and the environment. So um, I do utilize the Nurse Climate uh, Challenge resources to teach my students about climate change and the impact it has on, on each of us. Um, I posted several educational sessions and was quite um, busy last year, of course, as everyone was with, uh, with Zoom meetings. Um, it's interesting to note that the feedback I most often received was uh, the immediate interest in my students wanting to join the one and only Jane Fonda for Fire Drill Fridays. Um, I share that just to note that we have to continue our vi visibility and give access to um, advocacy tools. Um, I know that my network of nurses and uh, educators um, want to really know how they can um, best support our efforts. And then that starts with having conversations on platforms like this. So I began testifying on environmental issues on behalf of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments and, and now frequently um, speak to local and federal policymakers um, advocating for policy to improve air quality. After um, testifying for the first time back in uh, 2016 um, to elected officials in Washington, D.C., I realized the unique and, and really the important voice nurses have when it comes to um, advocating for environmental health. Um, and, and I've really just been invested in doing more ever since. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the good news that we just received from the White House yesterday. It was a big day from a climate perspective. Um, President Biden took executive actions to tackle the climate crisis here in the US and of course abroad. 
Um, the orders aim to freeze new oil and gas leases on, um, on public lands and uh, double offshore wind pro uh, produced energy by 2030. So this of course sets uh, an ambitious climate tone and one that we can all really build upon as we gain uh, the momentum in our collective efforts against the climate crisis that we're facing. Um, according to officials, climate change under President Biden's plan will, be, will become both a national security and also foreign policy and really making it a central issue of his administration um, as he aims to conserve at least 30% of federal lands and oceans by again 2030. To put this into context, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments uh, warned that, that air pollution from oil and gas drilling could worsen COVID impacts. So we already know that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has brought the long-standing public health inequities into hyper-focus. And we know that there are vulnerable communities that bear a greater burden of oil and gas pollution, uh, which may also put them at risk from COVID-19. So our response to the pandemic must be through a holistic lens, prioritizing vulnerable communities impacted by racism, health inequities, and of course, uh, air pollution. We, we really do need those bold solutions in order to um, commit to a healthier future in, in this country for all. So our understanding of healthy environments being vital to optimal health is examined very early on in our, our academic careers in uh, nursing school, actually. Um, we can say that the nursing profession has roots in identifying and understanding the link between the environment and health uh, through the work of you know, the Florence Nightingale, the woman with the lamp. She recognized and analyzed the impact of clean air and water. From my practice as a school nurse uh, to testifying in Washington DC, like I've mentioned, I've made it a priority to really advocate on behalf of our most vulnerable populations. Um, I was a, a proud 2020 ACLS uh, climate scholar. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I, I threw that in there. Um, and I, I would like to point out that as the most trusted profession, nurses are in such a unique position right now to amplify our voices and really take direct action um, on climate change to again protect the public's health. Um, as, an, uh, as an adjunct nursing professor, I am committed, uh, committed to helping future nurses just really understand that role that we have in addressing critical issues related to the environment and climate health. Um, I stress that a healthy environment is vital to um, really optimal health and, and use my experience in advocacy to, to bring the research to life in many of my courses, including policy and ethics, uh, legal and ethical issues in nursing, and of course, community health nursing, um, just to name a few. One of my immediate and professional goals last year was to facilitate the National Association of School Nurses, um, the permanent pro professional organization for school nurses, and really the authoritative resource for evidence-based uh, education policy um, advocacy and practice uh, to become a member of the Nursing Collaborative on Climate Change and Health. And um, the Nursing Collaborative, as viewers may know, in partnership between Annie, Climate for Health, and other national nursing organizations, aimed at building visible nursing leadership in addressing climate change as a health priority. So I'm proud to say that as of June of 2020, NASN is now part of the collaborative. Um, what this does is really gives school nurses the necessary tools and guidance needed to work on real climate change solutions right where they're at. I continue to be hopeful that through the collaborative, other school nurses will join me in the nurses drawdown and make a commitment to action to really reduce their climate impact and inspire others um, within their schools and their communities and of course across um, the country. This really is again our year to use our voices and um, just uh, bring this to the public forum. Um, and, and we have already seen first research to emerge uh, out of Italy that noted a, a possible link uh, between COVID-19 
severity and air pollution. So air pollution induces inflammation in the lung cells and air pollution um, exposure could ultimately increase the severity of COVID-19 symptoms and put some communities at greater risk of, of death from the virus as our lungs are, are, are particularly sensitive to damage from it. We've started to look at um, the implication of the oil and gas industry on communities right here in the US in, um, in three Western states, Colorado, Montana, and New Mexico that have experienced high COVID-19 um, morbidity and mortality rates. So the link really is not known specifically in the mortality link um, to the proximity to oil and gas wells, but we already have the evidence that indicates a direct harm to our health from the ozone and um, particle pollution. So we, we really need to make sure that we're advocating to increase uh, funding for public health programs for research and regulatory actions to prevent environmental exposures and protect those who are at risk, um, including the CDC's climate and health program and the EPA. Um, I'll hand it over to Eugenia so she can speak a little bit more um, at, at how healthcare providers can really move the policies needed in order to do just that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria. Um, so much of what you, you said in your own remarks, I, I feel compelled to repeat in mine because it's just so spot on. Um, but first, good evening, and thank you um, also to the Humanist Association for inviting me to join to discuss today's discussion. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Eugenia Gibbons, the Boston Director of Climate Policy at Healthcare Without Harm. And for those who are unfamiliar with our organization, Healthcare Without Harm is a global nonprofit that works to transform healthcare worldwide by reducing the sector's carbon footprint, helping hospitals become a community anchor for sustainability, and driving action on climate change so that the sector can be a leader in the global movement for environmental health and justice. I am really honored to be here alongside Gloria this evening. Um, we work in a sector that really sits at the intersection of climate, health, and equity. As Gloria discussed, our hospitals um, in particular have really been on the front lines of the COVID crisis. But even before that, sector leaders were charging forward with investments in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and in setting ambitious decarbonization goals partly because there are significant economic benefits to doing so, that is indisputable, but also because there's a real opportunity for hospitals to contribute to the environmental resilience of the communities where they are serving as anchor institutions. And so that is really important, um, a really important motivator when, when we're thinking about the role of the healthcare sector in driving the change that we need to see. Um, increasingly, extreme weather is uh, caused by climate change. It's ravaging our natural and built environments. It causes billions of dollars in damaged infrastructure. Um, it can make facilities inaccessible or inoperable, and it's inoperable, and it certainly leaves homes uninhabitable. We've seen this here um, in communities just outside Boston, where I'm located, um, but we see it nationwide too. Uh, an example of just some of the local effects of climate change in the last year, in 2020, Massachusetts had its worst drought in four years following a prolonged stretch of dry weather. And that induced water restrictions, it increased fire risks. It also contributed to um, heat-related illness and heat-related death, which um, still in this country is the, um, the number one weather-related killer. Um, as Gloria noted, the burning of fossil fuels really does cause climate change, but it's long-term exposure to the higher than average levels of particulate matter associated with burning fossil fuels that causes some of our most severe health impacts, things like asthma and diabetes, heart and lung disease. And these impacts, as was noted, are at their worst in low-income communities and communities of color. Those are the places where residents are disproportionately bearing the burden and the harm associated with climate change. And they are experiencing the, the generational effects of discriminatory policies that are not only energy related. Um, so <laughs> um, 
when I was preparing tonight, I was thinking about that. And I was also thinking about the many events of the last year between COVID-19 and destruction caused by wildfires, the racial reckoning that is occurring nationwide. And you know, all of these things just really reinforce the many structural inequities that exist in our country that were put in place often through policy and that can be undone with good policy. If we don't address these things, then we will see the same communities who have been left most vulnerable to the COVID virus exposed to the effects of and ravaged by climate change. So that is, the, uh, that is why there is an imperative to act on climate through policy. There's, uh, but if there was to be a silver lining from the last year, I would say that because there is a realization that this is our reality and this is the system within which we are working, there's also a recognition, a formal and very public recognition that um, racism itself is a public health crisis. We saw the American Public Health Association declare this last year. There's increasing recognition that the devastation caused by climate change, not only the pollution that it causes, but climate change itself is a public health crisis. And um, in the absence of federal leadership on climate in recent years, we also have seen cities, states, municipalities, um, local leaders and state leaders really step up as well as sector leaders really step up to declare climate a priority and to work to engage some of these new voices as Gloria referenced, not the usual suspects, but new messengers and new voices to tell a compelling story about how climate and the effects of climate change are being realized every day in communities across the country. So this is really critical because what that has allowed in pulling in some of these new voices and in telling real stories about climate change and what it, what it looks like in real time, we're also seeing a shift to really think about environmental justice and the importance of, of weaving into the conversation, not just greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, but climate justice and really working to anchor climate solutions at all levels in um, a transformation and a transition away from the status quo and really trying to right the wrongs of past bad policy. Um, I would, I just wanna close because we're gonna have a great conversation, but I think the only things I wanna add to, to what we've already um, mentioned or to reinforce is that um, in addition to really beginning to anchor the discussion in, in environmental justice and climate justice, um, we're also uh, seeing people really leverage this opportunity to pull in new voices, as, as Gloria was saying. So healthcare professionals, I mean, we certainly at Healthcare Without Harm utilize the voice of the healthcare sector because the healthcare sector is a very large em emitter of energy and of climate, or very large user of energy and large emitter of climate change and pollution, but also an economic engine in many of the places where the facilities are located, um, are committed for community resilience reasons to making sure that cleaner choices are made and are dealing daily, as Gloria noted, with patients and a patient population that are experiencing the worst effects of climate change and public health already. So it's really a, a, an important thing to amplify these voices because they can speak credibly from experience about what this looks like in real time. Um, the other thing is, as we're pushing for swift action and charting an equitable path to decarbonization in the US, it's wonderful that we have leadership in Washington now that has really made clear that this is a top priority. Um, I, am, I feel like every day I'm singing, um, I wanna like sing brand new day from the Wiz. <laughs> Um, because every new announcement is reinforcing the, the statement that this is a priority that's going to be a North Star for this administration as we think through so solving the climate crisis. We need to ca capture that moment, capture the lightning in the bottle and run with that and maintain momentum. But um, we also, it won't be enough to just rest on announcements and rely on promises. We really need to continue to move forward at the state and local level to really drive the change we wanna see, 
through policy initiatives, through program implementation. And so that requires us to make sure we continue to engage in ongoing advocacy to really make sure that we're bringing solutions, climate solutions to scale. That's the role of my sector. That's the role of hospitals to really demonstrate through action that these things are achievable to really encourage sector leaders um, and also um, administrations across the country to, to rely on science-based target and to set science-based targets across all sectors. We're seeing that already. Even today, we, there was an announcement from GM that they're going to um, be rolling out a significant number of electric vehicles and are also committed to um, decarbonization in their own um, their own operations. And if they have set very ambitious targets for the mid 2030s that are consistent with um, transitioning away from fossil fuels. So we need to see this happen everywhere, all sectors, all states, all communities. Um, and then I think from a health perspective, it's so important to really embrace the healing aspects for hospitals to really embrace the healing aspects of their mission and for um, providers to embrace that but also for decision makers to recognize that there are significant health benefits associated with acting on climate that right now are not valued adequately. So often the conversation shifts almost immediately to the cost of action, but we are not adequately thinking about or quantifying the cost of climate inaction. And if we were to really do that, then we would start to value probably more than anything else the lives saved and the um, health incidences avoided because of action and prior prioritization of climate, um, climate initiatives. So we really need to embrace the healing actions, the healing impacts of, of doing this now. And then um, alongside that last point, I think the other thing is we really need to make sure that folks understand, particularly decision makers, understand that um, it's okay for them to maybe um, move against some of the deeply entrenched interests who have a, have a stake in seeing things move slowly or seeing the status quo be sustained and to really be willing to invest in the solutions and um, the strategies that will lead to the transformation that we are working to see. 2050 is a long way off but it's also gonna be here before we know it. So the longer we take to try to begin to shift the way we make and use energy, the way we prioritize um, community health and um, lives really, and vulnerable populations, the longer we take to do that, the harder it's gonna be to get over this climate hurdle um, 30 years from now. So we need to prioritize action now um, set the ball in motion, take advantage of the opportunities that are, pre that are presenting themselves almost daily lately, and really learn from the hard lessons that 2020 taught us in the midst of a pandemic to pull all of these threads together, take a holistic approach, as Gloria noted, and really make the commitment to transform um, our economy and our communities for the better. I think if we, we can all get on board with that um, vision and moving towards that outcome, we will all be better for it. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it back over to Emily and I think we're gonna do q and A. I I did wanna just interject Eugenia, um, just because you said something really powerful about the disparities and in the US, we know that our zip code determines our life expectancy more so than our genetic code. Um, and, and climate change really is exacerbating um, those health disparities. And the same pollution that worsens air quality and accelerates climate change also harms our lungs and makes us more susceptible um, to COVID-19 and respiratory infections as, as mentioned previously. What, we, what we've really seen though, um, especially in my practice, is the disproportionate effects of climate change on our Latino communities. Um, as part of my service work, I've participated in the promotion of climate literacy and health literacy among the Latino community, and I'm committed to really ongoing um, advocacy to ensure that 
policies and resources are appropriately deployed to address climate change and minimize its impact among um, our most vulnerable populations. Um, and, and just going back to your point, uh, of course, we must continue our efforts to just decrease greenhouse emissions and improve the readiness and resilience of, um, of those populations noted. Um, climate change continues to affect the, the many of the social and environmental determinants of health, mm -hmm. um, which we already heard, including clean air, safe drinking water, sufficient food, and of course, secure shelter. Um, we, we already know that climate change makes us sick and we're seeing it in, in, in every aspect of, of nursing. Um, I've noticed an increase just in the amount of students um, with asthma year after year. On average, in a class of about 30, um, about three students are likely to have a diagnosis of asthma. And really to address this concern, I've focused on ensuring better management of asthma in my school and raising awareness and education about the impact of air quality on, on student health. Because um, we know that, again, that exposure to poor air quality impacts um, the, the, their health and, and contributes to adverse outcomes um, such as you know, cancer, cardiovascular and respiratory harm, and of course, premature death. Action to, to decrease air pollution is really a public health priority to create healthy environments uh, for all. And again, just the science is clear. Uh, climate change is one of the most serious threats to human health that we face today. And as nurses, we have a duty to provide our patients, our communities, our families, and our children with a safe and healthy future. Um, I would challenge each nurse listening to join the Nurses Drawdown movement um, by taking personal and just professional action in, in five key areas. And those are uh, energy, food, nature, mobility, and gender equity. Um, for example, I took the challenge to limit my red meat intake to only twice a week. Um, you know, it may seem like a small impact by any comparison, but will incur a big return for all if we if we each do our part. Um, and I just wanna make sure that the listeners know where to find that, it's nursesdrawdown.org. Um, and I'm just closing it out with uh, making sure that the call to action is that we each have the power and responsibility to significantly impact climate change and really make a difference. Um, we just each need to do our, our small part and change will happen. Thank you both so much for uh, giving us all that information. And I, I loved also how you were building off of each other, showing how interconnected the um, the local with the national, the policy with the personal decision making. Um, I did just put nursesdrawdown.org in the chat. And I also connected to what you were just saying, wanted to point out um, a New York Times a graphic that actually uh, our intern Caroline uh, shared with us earlier today um, that shows all of the climate threats um, happening around the country and kind of helps you visualize all of the harm that's happening and could happen if we don't take enough climate action now. Um, I want to start with um, is, so what local steps can we take to advocate for those disproportionately impacted by climate change? That's a good question. I, um, there are a couple of, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, the first is engage with your local um, environmental justice organizations and really find out, that's a question to ask them, <laughs> um, really find out what are the needs, what are the fights that are underway, what are the opportunities for you to engage and be a support, be supportive and help amplify the message and engage others. There, I'm just thinking about here in, in Massachusetts, there are a number of ongoing environmental justice battles that are currently um, being waged, and there are some really stellar and important organizations who are leading the charge and who need to be the leading voice because they are anchored in the community where the facility is being cited or where the health impacts that Gloria spoke about are being experienced daily. So the first thing is find out who in your um, area is working on these um, issues and is, is doing the grass roots level engagement and and engage, participate, learn from it. It could be something as, as um, 
is as introductory as taking like a toxics tour because often people don't even realize what is what is um poisoning them is really in their backyard and so learn about that figure out where it is and, and what's being done to address it the other thing i will mention is we have seen in the last year states taking on environmental justice um, policy changes. And I think that is so important because um, I, for a long time, we've taken for granted that in, environmental injustice is occurring daily and the protections that are needed to be built into statute don't exist, or if they do exist, they're inadequate, or they don't reflect this challenge of climate change. And so I can say, at least here in Massachusetts, we are having, um, there's a bill that's currently before, the, it was just sent back to the governor's desk today, actually. And it includes language that would update for the first time in 20 years, the state environmental justice policy. That's important because what that does is, and it would be the same in any state, that sets the tone for, for what is, what's the bare minimum where we're starting the conversation about how to prioritize investment in resources, about how to define the communities and the populations who have been disproportionately affected for so long, and for um, how we make effort to truly redress harm. So uh, I would say, in addition to engaging locally with local groups, find out what your state is doing or your city is doing to start to really layer into its climate planning or its climate uh, clean energy and climate preparedness environmental justice priorities and efforts to really anchor the work in equity and in environmental justice. Um, I, I would just add to that, that although um, many of my students, I've heard it time and time again, um, kind of say, well, th that's not, that's not really for me to, to stand up or to speak up against climate change, um, you know, and I just want to remind them and remind anybody listening, um, aspiring nurses or practicing nurses that that nursing is political. Um, we know that, and and we've already seen that we're we're right now center stage, and this is this is really our time to um, to really collectively just speak out against um, climate change because it, it is. It is a public health threat, and um, like Eugenia mentioned, it's just knowing who's doing the grassroots efforts and just join them because they already have the tools that you need to succeed. Um, we have a question here. What are your thoughts on a carbon fee and dividend, which would be used to give payments to those impacted by the economic disparity caused by carbon emission slash climate change? Um, especially as those in lower socioeconomic classes will incur such drastic medical debt from unsanitary and unhealthy living conditions. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Gloria. Um, I will say it's complicated. <laughs> there are um, differing opinions about the value of, of um, carbon pricing and, and cap and invest programs. And they are, um, there isn't, they do have a place in the conversation when we're thinking about how to address um, climate change and really begin to draw down emissions. I think the only way those strategies will be meaningful and will be a useful tool for ensuring that we are moving down an equitable path is if the design of the programs, um, both how the, the programs take shape and then also how they are implemented begins with the voices of those who will be most affected, who are already most affected by pollution and who will potentially be most affected by the, um, by the programs themselves. So I, we've certainly seen this conversation play out in different areas across the country, most recently here on the Northeast um, around transportation emissions. And I just think that um, the way to approach that, uh, again, thinking about how to achieve equitable outcomes always has to begin and end with making sure um, the most impacted individuals are around the table from the start. 
Otherwise you end up in a situation where something is designed with the best intentions and then gets imposed upon people um, without regard for what the lived experience is and um, has unintended consequences or may potentially cause more harm than good. Um, yeah, you said that nicely, Eugenia. I have nothing else to add. Um, unfortunately, that's not an area that I've really looked into, but I definitely will follow up um, just to make sure that I'm educated um, on, on that moving forward. Um, well, then to even it out, uh, Gloria, I'll, I'll give you kind of a direct question. Um, you know, there's been, of course, a lot of debate and still ongoing um, about the reopening of schools. And I'm curious if the the school nurses or university um, nurses have been fully heard um, and appreciated in those conversations. Um, and if there's any, you know, kind of input that that you'd like to share with us. Sure. Um... When, when you say when you're saying schools of nursing, I'm going to go to my, my full time job because yes I teach but my full time job is as a, a public health nurse, um, I work full time as a school nurse. And um, we, we, what I can just tell you is that we can no longer shy away from uh, these climate conversations. We are the experts, we have our nation's trust. Um, but in, in my current role and as a subset of the nation's public health nursing workforce, um, I'd like to again just touch on the need for increased funding for public health. Uh, we know that children that have access to a school nurse in their school every single day have improved health outcomes. Um, we are essential to the health of our nation's children, and not only during the pandemic, but after too. Um, so the percentage of children with chronic health conditions continue to rise. Um, and state and federal laws have increased, increasingly reinforced that the role of uh, schools is to keep children healthy. And according to just recent data, 25% of schools do not employ a school nurse. Um, so that, that shortage was made very clear in the headlines as schools uh, raced to, to find um, you know, a reopening plan that included school nurses. Uh, we've been on the front lines working with uh, changing guidelines, changing metrics, and, and really we are ready to be essential members of uh, any pandemic preparedness. And we, we've been ready to, to be part of those conversations of reopening and reentry planning teams. But we know that the rea reality is that we were missing from those decision-making tables, not by choice, but because um, we just weren't there. Uh, we weren't employed. So we do need funding to ensure that every child has access to a full-time school nurse every single day. Um, so we're talking a lot about the uh, impact on climate of climate on people's health, but I think you know you also both have um, some knowledge about how uh, the impact that healthcare has on the climate and how we have to make you know some big decisions in order to um, not you know further um, increase our crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, healthcare as a sector is a huge contributor to climate change, as I mentioned um, in my opening remarks. And I think that's one of the, the combination of recognizing the impact that the sector is having on the problem and also acknowledging that it is the only sector that has healing as a mission at the center of its mission. Um, though that combination is what's really driving certainly healthcare without harm, but also um, practitioners to really try to work to remedy these these problems. You know, it's very hard to treat patients. I, I would imagine it's very hard to treat patients who are sick because of the thing, the because of climate change, which you as a system are contributing to by the nature of your operations, from the energy that you're you're consuming each day to the um, you know, the products you're procuring. So there's a real um, a case to be made for why the healthcare sector is, is moving as quickly as it can. I can certainly um, provide a couple of um, numbers just to put it into perspective. You know, what is the carbon footprint of healthcare? And um, I would say uh, there's a study from 2019 
um, that Healthcare Without Harm released. And it just looked at what healthcare's carbon footprint was um, globally and in the US. And globally, it accounts for um, four, almost four and a half percent of global net emissions, which is the equivalent of 514 coal-fired power plants. So that's not insignificant at all. Um, if the sector were its own country, it'd be the fifth largest emitter in the world. And of course, the US is a primary global, is the global emitter um, in absolute emissions per capita, per capita. So again, it's just, you know, it's very difficult to say we have to address something and then not acknowledge the way that you're contributing to it. And I think that is why we see hospitals and health systems and practitioners and clinicians really stepping forward and saying, this is a priority and we need to do something. And then also, I think, I mean, as Gloria has already said, it's also why um, they can speak so credibly to the impacts that are being experienced on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and the real toll that inaction takes on communities. I think I would just um, close out, if I may, that that um, we we know that the health impacts of climate change demand bold and, and really immediate action from, from us all. Um, and by addressing climate change right now, we have the opportunity to significantly improve public health. And we've, we've already proven that we're the most trusted professions, uh, professionals and, and now nurses can, uh, can act and just advocate for real solutions. Um, and we, we have that moral and just professional responsibility to ensure that. Um, and I think that I, I would just again, encourage anyone interested, um, listening to nurses for healthy environments um, and also the climate for health um, and, and join us, join us in taking action on climate change uh, on behalf of the patients and the communities that, that you serve. Um, can you both expand a little on uh how the COVID pandemic has changed the conversation on public health and uh, health and the environment. We, hope, I mean, I'm hoping that, I know some articles, we've increased the talk, we've all been sort of a little bit more aware of it, but um, how much is, you know, really sticking in people's minds? Hmm. Um, sure, I mean, it's definitely sticking in people's minds. I think COVID has just laid bare the inequality and inequity that exists in this country um, for, you know, around everything, housing, transportation, access to health, access to education, access to good food, all of the things to good employment, so many, or, or sustainable employment, all of these things. Um, and we're seeing more and more the research coming out as Gloria noted, that's making, that's making very clear that there is a connection between prolonged exposure to particulate matter and to um, air pollution and the, devastate, the most devastating effects that the virus is having. And also that most of the communities that are suffering from prolonged exposure to pollution who are already predisposed to um, respiratory and um, circulatory illness are also suffering the worst effects of the virus themselves. I, I think um, American Lung Association just re-released re uh, its blog post on uh, the link between health and COVID, uh, pollution and COVID. And I think they estimate that um, their, their research shows that there's, for community, for, patients who are exposed to pollution over a prolonged period of time or um, hazardous air pollutants in particular, there's a 9% greater risk of death associated with the virus. So the numbers speak for themselves. People who suffer from the worst health effects regularly are dying more because of COVID. And people have, and, and I'm sorry, Gloria, go ahead. I was gonna say, and, and uh, legislators are recognizing this and decision -makers, makers are recognizing this because it's literally happening to their constituents in their backyard and they have to respond to that. 
Right. I think what what I just wanted to mention was um, what's happening in in some parts of California, especially after you know the fires that we heard about. Um, a lot of my colleagues are um, you know practitioners there, and and a lot of them are good friends. And what they were seeing was that correlation between um, the the proximity to the fires and then also um, the the COVID nineteen symptoms exacerbation. So um, yeah, there there is. Uh, in an immediate right now, I think um, just action that that we need to take, um, and I think that it starts with these conversations. But um, to take it a bit further, it does also uh, we have to put back the own the onusness on on nurses to just um, you know be part of the solution and and help us um, with with what we're doing again with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Again, connected to that, um, we've got a question uh, from somebody in uh, a big medical treatment in a big hospital, and they said that the use of disposables, especially plastic, is incredible. It has increased with COVID. Um, what are some ways to give hospitals economically and hygienically feasible alternatives? Uh, you know, that's actually an interesting lesson learned from COVID. We're seeing hospitals um, who, because of shortages of PPE early on in the COVID crisis, were really forced to um, come up with innovative solutions that included things like exploring, um, reuse, um, trying to uh, reduce, uh, you know, things from waste streams to think through if necessity is the mother, mother of invention, as they say, I think um, COVID has created an opportunity to really sort of re-examine the consumption that occurs um, within the four walls of a hospital. So uh, certainly Gloria could speak to this better than I can <laughs> as, a, as a nurse, but I do think that is something that um, COVID created. Yeah, yeah, I think going back to that point is just the the innovation that that came out of it. Um, what we're seeing just with Johnson and Johnson is the nurse um, nursing innovation really taking the lead on on seeing that there there are issues in um, in our healthcare system, and this goes beyond climate change, beyond COVID nineteen, um, and and really that nurses do have the knowledge and the expertise, and we're at the bedside, and and we can make those um, innovative uh, ideas just come to um, just come to life. So I think that we're going to be seeing a lot of um, innovative ideas coming from Johnson and Johnson on on exactly what Eugenia just mentioned on just reducing that. Um, that that wastefulness because it really is it's it's wastefulness and and we're adding to it um, even if we're trying to to be positive and and do all this advocacy work then we're we're still being wasteful when we're when we're at work and that's just not um, that doesn't sit well with me and I I don't think that it sits well with a lot of um, my colleagues so I think that that's something that that we'll be seeing and that I'm hopeful for that's a good question. Yeah. Um, and I'll just do one more on COVID because I know that that's not, you know, it's on everyone's minds, even though it's not uh, the only thing we need to think about. Um, but there definitely has been some questions about the uh, possible surge of common communicable diseases after COVID spreads um, and um, possibly due to the, uh, the social distancing limiting exposure for people. Um, and I think the um, kind of in a bigger picture too, that idea of like what lessons have medical professionals been able to learn kind of looking at like the silver lining of COVID um, issues that are preparing us for more health issues, especially those that we know climate change is connected to. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that question. I think that there's, um, there, there has been a lot of lessons learned, but I don't think that we're done learning yet. Um, and I don't want to jump ahead yet to say that, you know, that we have this uh, and, and we're done because we know that we're not and we know that it starts with vaccination. Um, and that's, you know, the beginning of the end. But I I'm hopeful that we've we've learned, at least in the public health sector, that primary prevention is key. Um, primary prevention could be, yes, vaccinations, but also just 
um, you know, hand hygiene. I think going back to the basics of hand hygiene and, um, and, and making sure that we're not only protecting ourselves, but um, the most vulnerable populations that, that we come into contact with. Um, and I think that that's probably, for me, the biggest takeaway from a public health uh, perspective that, that I've been teaching right now my students on just, let's go back to the fundamentals and just um, look at this from, from that lens. Um, so going back to kind of the, the individual um, actions and responsibility, we have a 17 year old here uh, that has been active with the climate strikes each week. And um, although passerbys can be loud with honking, shouting, sometimes it feels like the only thing I get in return is silence. Nobody actually takes action. What would your advice be for making a substantial difference in a community's carbon emissions if they don't already have a group or organization in place to tackle that matter? Well, well first, I just wanna applaud the 17 year old. Um, and, and really to, to say that I'm hopeful for, for this, gen, this next generation um, is an understatement because working at a high school, I see that, um, that just rejuvenation and the, the, the energy that they have, not only for, for uh, environmental justice, but just for social justice um, in general, that the, the ideas that they have, and I mean, it, it's just, it's unbelievable to me, but I'm, I'm really proud to, to see it firsthand, especially in the high school where I'm working at. Um, and, and on a personal level, I mean, my, my son, he, he's gonna be 17 in April. And that, that's why I say that I'm very hopeful for this next generation because they, they are fearless and um, he, he's attesting to it. He's saying that you know he's, he's out here doing a climate strike every week and I applaud him for that. Um, I have I have nothing but um, just accolades. As far as feedback, just keep going. We we need you. Yeah. I um I don't think I can add anything to that except to say I also um am, am inspired daily by um the youth and the youth <laughs> and also the folks who will inherit what we are what we are trying to preserve i have i have young kids myself and um really even even at the young age of 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 8 my daughter understands why this is important and um you know why we need to move quickly so that keeps me motivated i think even if you had to make an individual choice um don't be overwhelmed if it feels like things are moving at a glacial plate, glacial pace. Sometimes many small changes add up to something really big and then all of a sudden there's a snowball and we, we get to where we are. So um, for example, your own choice of, of electricity supply or in your home or the food that you eat or what are individual steps that you can take to kind of reduce your own personal impact and then how can you share that and bring others in to make the same um, choices and then how do you kind of you know, i think municipalities are really um leaders they have the potential to be leaders on some of these things because it only takes a few squeaky wheels locally to really um, introduce an idea and move something quickly at a local level and then that can bubble up to the state level so one example would be just going back to electricity choice um, we're seeing many, com many communities to make commitments to be 100% renewable or to pursue net zero goals. That makes a difference. If you have enough communities in a state who make that choice, then suddenly the state has to examine what are we doing? Why aren't we making this the standard? And how do we, how do we move faster? So um, thank you for doing Fire Drill Fridays. Thank you for engaging and um, know that people take notice. And even if you think you're not having a huge impact, you are because those things add up very quickly. Um, is there a backlash right now to inclusion of environmental justice in all policy making and conversations as there has been to the Black Lives Matter movement this summer? 
Um, and what do we say to someone who maybe wants to undermine environmental justice priority? Hmm. Um, by, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I think that um, I would be less concerned about potential backlash to prioritizing EJ than I am about watering down commitments or paying lip service to acting or prioritizing climate justice and environmental justice. So, that, so I think the events of the spring have um, really made a lot of organizations and decision makers take a hard look at the way that they are contributing to a meaningful conversation and pursuit of a real plan that achieves equitable climate action. And they've had to think about the ways in which they need to be more proactive um, to advance that goal and the ways that they can meaningfully amplify the voices of groups on the ground who have been leading on environmental justice for, for decades. The environmental justice is, environmental justice is a movement that is over 20 years old. So um, I think the first thing is we have to be careful that we're not just paying lip service to equity and to a commitment to equity and that we're really actually engaging with the people who have been leading the movement for so long and amplifying those priorities and weaving those priorities into our policy conversations. That's the first piece. The second piece is, I just, I think you say to the people, there is no climate justice, there is no climate action or, or climate future without climate justice. You cannot say, it's great if we achieve emission reductions, we've just solved the climate crisis, but by the way, we still left all those people behind who are living next to polluting facilities, whose water is polluted, who don't have access to clean food, so on and so forth. That's just not an equitable future. That is not the climate future that I think any of us are trying to achieve. And so if you're not starting the conversation at this point in 2021 with, how do we achieve an equitable uh, climate compliant future, then you are not starting the conversation in the right place. And I think that's where, that's the message you say to anybody who's questioning the importance or validity of environmental justice um, concerns and action. I, I think just, I would close that out with um, our, our most at risk, um, the vulnerable populations that we keep on referring to are um, our children, the elderly, low income, and of course, minorities, which are, um, you know, black, indigenous, uh, people of color, Latinos, and the burden of uh, pollution and climate change really does fall unfairly um, on, on these populations. And that creates the health disparities that um, that Eugenia mentioned. Um, so Eugenia, you mentioned at the beginning about um, getting excited about some of the current work that the new administration is doing. Um, do you want to share some that you uh, kind of expect, some other actions you expect to see or are fighting to um, push through? Well, I think it's still early. <laughs> And, um, you know, I'd be happy to share our priorities for um, that, that we're advocating for in the new administration. But I think uh, when I said that, I, th I was referring specifically to um, the, we're seeing um, the creation of health equity and energy justice um, roles being Im embedded in this in this administration. The Department of Energy just uh, created its first ever energy justice position. Um, that's very exciting because it means the conversation is shifting and the perspective is changing and we're gonna start to see um, things like health and access woven into the conversation around um, you know, energy supply. Um, we are seeing even within um, the healthcare sector and within uh, HHS, again, the creation of, of spaces where health and equity alongside climate will be prioritized and pursued. So I think that's um, very exciting. And just honestly, it's really nice um, 
to know that um, climate is a priority again and climate action is a priority again. Um, and that what that's one of the things that just has me um, really looking forward to where we're going to go because as uh, you know, states for a while have been trying to hold the line on climate. They need to be pushed along by folks on the ground, but they have been trying to hold the line. And um, when there's strong leadership and the potential for a real part federal partner coming out of Washington, it means that we might actually see some of these states fulfill the commitments that they've made to things like offshore wind or um, you know, transitioning away from fossil fuels, really focusing on environmental justice concerns, so on and so forth. And so that is really um, exciting for me to see the, state, the, the way that the states are going to be able to interact with significant investment coming out of and leadership coming out of Washington. Um, Emily, I think that we found uh, the, the next series. It could be, you know, this. Yeah. Just, <laughs> um, you know, a look back and it could it can be in, in December just to close out and really look back and and see how um, how the policies have have changed, hopefully also giving it that global lens, um, working to incorporate the elements that Eugenia mentioned of uh, how how just policy and advocacy is is working to address the the um, the health crisis that we're seeing, um, and yeah, I think that 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 conversation needs to continue. Um, what is it, day nine, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I would really like to uh, to revisit the, the conversation at a later time. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that, it is only day nine feels like it's been so much longer. <laughs> but uh, the only thing I'd add to that is as optimistic and excited as I am about what's happening in Washington, it does not mean we should be slowing momentum in our states or on the ground. I mean, the only way we're gonna really get to where we need to be is to continue moving full steam ahead um, in the way that many of us already were. Accountability is still key no matter who's in Washington. Yeah, and I think that my just my personal goal for this year would just be to to really look at that um, that global lens because I've been really focused on what what I can do within um, you know my state um, and you know just been barely skimming on what I can be doing on the national level with the organizations that I'm a part of, but looking at that global unification really is vital to um, advancing action just to reduce uh, health threats posed by um, climate change. Um, do you think that government is capable of being convinced of environmental issues and their connection to our health and being convinced into action. So beyond just, you know, climate action, like the making more, um, moving more towards some evidence-based um, healthcare policies. Eugenia, I'll let you answer that. I, I sure <laughs> hope so. Uh, yes, I do believe that. And I actually, I believe it because I see greater effort being made to tie the health story to the climate story. Greenhouse gas emission reductions may be the goal. It is not the most compelling story to tell. Um, improved health outcomes, community resilience, people who can breathe now because they don't have a polluting facility in their backyard. Those are stories that resonate and those are the things that need to be pulled into the co policy conversation. And so uh, certainly for elected officials who interact regularly with their constituents, the health story is far more compelling than strict um, you know, emissions reductions. Uh, I think it's health, I think it's an economic story, it's jobs, and it's an equity story. And that is very much uh, being reflected now in many of the conversations that are happening out across the state, the country. And I'd like to add to that just a reminder for folks um, that the Congressional Free Thought Caucus uh, that we work closely with, uh, with the American Humanist Association, is full of legislators who are using evidence-based, reason-based, empathy-based um, 
policy and research in order to move government forward. And I also wanted to point out that um, one of the co-founders of that caucus, Representative Jared Huffman, was appointed to another term on the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. So we've got you know a humanist on board helping us with um, with our uh, climate action. Um, so thank you both. I want to give you an opportunity to give to leave us with some words of wisdom, calls to action, final thoughts about um, what you encourage us to do, um, and maybe if you'd like to remind folks of the uh, useful links. Um, you mentioned we can put them in the chat to make sure people follow up. Um, I'll just I'll I'll close out saying um, what I hope has really resonated with with many today that have been listening. And for those who stuck around, thank you. Um, I know that, <laughs> that it's been already an hour. Uh, the science is clear. Climate change is one of the most serious threats uh, to human health that, that we face today. And as nurses, we really do have a duty to provide our patients our communities, families, and children uh, with a safe and healthy future. So uh, any, any a nurse or aspiring nurse, I, I just really urge you to, um, to join us at the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. And um, if, if anything else, I think what I also wanna make sure that that was, uh, that was clear is that you, you can start where you're at. You don't have to have, um, you don't have to have that degree yet or uh, be even comfortable doing certain things. Um, you know, th this was this was outside of my comfort zone, but I did it anyways, because I said, um, even if my voice is going to shake, I'm still going to do it because I think that it's important that that we have a public health nurse um, talking about these issues. So I just wanted to, again, thank you um, for inviting me. Um, but just start start where you're at. And um, I'm never going to forget the 17 year old um, you know, uh, what, what he shared that that story is really going to stay with me. Um, so if that 17 year old is going to keep on doing what he's doing, um, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just say the takeaway is, you know, I love start where you are, me, you know, as an advocate, I always say I have to meet people where they are, and then we can move forward together. So Although it can be overwhelming to try to tackle the climate crisis or to try to tackle the health crisis, I think it's important to just remember there are pieces, everybody has a lever to pull. So just figure out which one yours is and we will get there together. Um, and I am, you know, I, I remain hopeful and optimistic at all times in part because I feel like I have kids and I have friends who have family they love and who are young and their future is on the line. I think of that 17 year old as well. And, and um, we can do this. We've made tremendous strides even in the last decade. And there's so much more that we can accomplish going forward. And we just have to keep our eye on the ball and, and eye on the prize and remember that, um, you know, there's a, there's a cleaner, more equitable, more sustainable way for us to um, build our economy and keep our states healthy and to keep our residents and our, our family and friends um, safe and healthy. And so we just have to do it. We just have to get it done. Um, so thank you for allowing us to join you this evening and for sticking around. And uh, this has been a really great and um, educational conversation for me. Thank you, Gloria, for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this this has been uh, definitely a learning experience for me as well. Um, I don't ever want to say that I'm uh, that I'm the expert in the room because then that means that I have nothing else to learn or um, to to grow from. And I want to um, continuously grow. And I am already going to look up that uh, that tax that that was mentioned that I wasn't familiar with. And um, also, it was interesting to hear the uh, the Free Thought Caucus. So I'm definitely going to follow up on that as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you both to Gloria and Eugenia. You know, I just want to highlight that several of the things you were mentioning so directly connect to the 10 commitments that the American Humanist Association promotes to explain, you know, the different elements of our values that include environmentalism, um, empathy, responsibility, 
uh, global awareness, and you just right now mentioned even humility, that awareness that we have more to learn uh, from each other. So um, thank you. Uh, to learn more about the 10 commitments, you can go to humanistcommitments.org. And uh, tonight I'm gonna hand it back to Carolyn uh, to close out our session. Yes, thank you everyone for your participation in tonight's event. And thank you again, Eugenia and Gloria for sharing your work and knowledge. We really appreciate it. I learned a lot and um, it's good to hear that you guys learned a lot too from each other. Um, you can find more information and details about Here for Climate at hereforclimate.org.